Jesus Christ, you are the light of the world, the light no darkness can overcome. Stay with us now, for it is evening, and the day is almost over. Let your light scatter the darkness and shine within your people here. God be with you all, and also with you. Let us sing our thanks to God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. Blessed are you, creator of the universe. From old you have led your people by night and day. May the light of your Christ make our darkness bright. For your word and your presence are the light of our pathways, and you are the light and life of all creation. My prayer. Of 
May our prayers come before you, O God, as incense, and may your presence surround and fill us, so that in union with all creation we might sing your praise and your love in our lives. Amen. Our first reading this evening comes from Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 6 and 16 to 21. Jesus says, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And continuing at verse 16, And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where, neither, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And our second reading comes from Isaiah chapter 58. Isaiah chapter 58, beginning with verse 1. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose, a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose? to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Today's, uh, tonight's theme regards food. And we can be pretty passionate about food. And perhaps it is because of this passion for food that the practice we focus on tonight is so rare. 
From our Matthew 6 text, we see that it's one of the three practices expected of early Christians. Here, Jesus refers to when you give alms or money for the care of those in need, and when you pray, and when you fast. Not if, but when. Jesus assumes those who follow him will give financially, will pray, and will fast. And yet today, fasting is not widely practiced. But there are incredible benefits to fasting. Foster writes uh, in Celebration of Discipline, our Lent text that we are engaging with this year, Foster writes, fasting can bring breakthroughs in the spiritual realm that will never happen in any other way. Fasting can bring breakthroughs in the spiritual realm that will never happen in any other way. So what is fasting? Fasting from a standpoint of faith is to abstain from food for spiritual purposes. It is choosing to not eat for a given period of time. And making the decision is the key, is one of the key factors in fasting. One of the most important pieces of fasting is the motive behind one's decision to fast. It's not about hoping to lose weight or to figure out diet restrictions. And fasting is different than a hunger strike or refusing to eat food to raise awareness or gain political strength. And fasting is not about aiming to get your own way on something. Whenever we use a faith practice as an attempt to manipulate a situation, it is a sure sign we are practicing false religion and not genuinely seeking a relationship with God. And if that's the aim, it isn't going to have a positive effect on one's faith. If while fasting you are seeking recognition from someone or, or some other aim other than genuine transformation as you come before God, then you will not receive the transformation of faith, the spiritual growth God promises to those who seek God. Fasting must always center on God, rooted in God's invitation aimed at nurturing one's relationship with God. One's eyes must be fixed on God. Fasting must be God-initiated and God-ordained. And then, then thoughtful, intentional fasting can produce all sorts of results. Fasting helps us keep our balance in life. It very quickly reveals what controls us. Its impact is huge on those longing to be transformed into the image of Christ. Foster writes, we cover up what is inside us with food and other good things. But in fasting, these things surface. When we fast, all sorts of things come to light. Whatever is being covered by food and other good things floats right up. Anger, bitterness, Jealousy, fear, rotten relationship or conflict, it all bubbles right up without the layers of sweets and meats weighing it down. But the thing about letting these things surface, we can rejoice in knowing these are there because healing is available through the power of Christ. Fasting reveals the anger within so that it may be resolved in Christ. Fasting reveals jealousy and bitterness so that they may be softened in Christ. Fasting reveals fear so that strength to overcome may be found in Christ. Fasting allows us to recenter on Christ. And so whatever comes up, it is a gift. It is a gift in as much as facing it with God's help can help us to draw ever nearer to Christ, to become more fully molded into God's image. What a blessing. 
And remember Foster's claim that fasting can bring breakthroughs in the spiritual realm that will never happen in any other way. Fasting can produce greater effectiveness in intercessory prayer. Fasting can aid in discerning difficult decisions. It can open you up to hear God's guidance. Fasting can increase concentration, can help to deliver you from bondage, can increase your physical well-being. It can bring revelations, reveal things that were otherwise hidden from you that now become clear. Fasting can transform your relationship with God. God is good. God is faithful. And God wants us to diligently seek God. And we can be confident that God will, we can expect that God will reward those who diligently seek God. This doesn't mean those who seek God will never experience hardship. That's not what I'm saying. But those who diligently seek God, God will respond. And even in the midst of sadness, there can be beauty from God, and God can bring bright spots on gloomy days. This, this is most certainly true. And fasting can remind us that in the end, all that we need comes from God. Jesus tells us in Matthew 4.4, 4, we are sustained by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And as the Gospel of John says of Jesus in John 4.32 and following, my food is to do the will of God who sent me. Fasting can transform you, can help grow in leaps and bounds in your faith journey. So all that being said, the case having been made for fasting, let's talk more about some practical pieces of fasting. There are different types of fasting. There's fasting from all food, solids and liquids, but still drinking water. There's a partial fast, which is a restricted diet. There's an absolute fast, which involves no food or water. And Foster says this should only be done if you have a very clear command from God and only for three days max. So when should you fast? There is no command in scripture to fast, no guidance given for a particular day or time length. And so there is flexibility. Foster calls that a gift. We have an opportunity to fast whenever we want. Fasting is not something that is always appropriate. Discernment is required as to whether a particular time calls for feasting or fasting. We know this because of Mark chapter 2 verses 18 and 20 uh, when John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to Jesus, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the, wedding can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. There are appropriate times to fast, and we are called to prayerfully discern those times. When it is a proper time to fast, it is always best to learn to walk before deciding to run. You can start with a time period of lunch one day to lunch the next day, and then try a 36-hour fast, and then a 3-7 to seven day fast. And to get super practical, it's smart if you're doing a longer fast to stop drinking before you start to to stop drinking coffee or tea a few days beforehand. And it does not help to stock up by eating a whole bunch more food before starting a fast. It's, big, it's better to begin eating less, to decrease to light meals before fasting. 
and to help with constipation, have your last meal be fresh fruits and vegetables before fasting. Foster's good at that really practical advice. And when it's time to break the fast, break the fast with fresh fruit juice or small amounts of fruit and vegetables, and also a good deal of inner rejoicing. Your stomach will have shrunk the digestive system in hibernation, so avoid salad dressing, grease, starch, avoid overeating, and consider upon breaking the fast what eating habits may need to be more disciplined as you go on. What changes do you need to keep as you go back into eating? Foster says, at least of us being well-fed as we are, in a regular 24 hours, when you feel hungry, just drink some water. It isn't real hunger. It is just a habit. The stomach is like a spoiled child, he writes. But you can choose to be a master to your stomach and not its slave. When fasting, you are not to look miserable, such as for attention. This was brought up in many ways in our readings as we began, both from Matthew 6 and from Isaiah 58. Devote time as family commitments allow to meditation and prayer. I like that Foster includes this. He is very clear with all the disciplines he discusses, uh, that all disciplines are about coming before God and seeking to be transformed by being in God's presence. Doing these practices to avoid cooking a meal or to have a reason for a break from family, that isn't going to do it. Or to be rigid about rules, this will not produce transformation. Foster writes, whenever there is a form devoid of spiritual power, Law will take over because law always carries with it a sense of security and manipulative power. There is danger uh, in, in our practices becoming about law when we aren't genuinely seeking time with God. And we are to take care not to make something that has a slight biblical precedent into a major obligation. This is not meant to be a rigid law, but an opportunity to come before God and be transformed by God's presence. What a beautiful blessing to have such opportunities in life. What a beautiful God we have. So I invite you to consider this discipline and whether it is for you. Foster questions, why has the giving of money been unquestionably recognized as an element in Christian devotion, and yet fasting is so disputed? He ponders, perhaps in our affluent society, fasting involves a far larger sacrifice than the giving of money. I wonder... At any rate, the major work of fasting is in the realm of the Spirit. I invite you to prayerfully consider the practice of fasting. See what comes up. See what you learn about yourself and how your, your relationship with God, uh, your identity in Christ is transformed and your faith deepened. Discern whether or not God is calling you to this discipline. If done with the right motivation, it can transform your life. For further practical pieces and uh, a reference to someone's journal who practiced fasting once per week for two years, I invite you to, to read the chapter on fa fasting in celebration of discipline. And whether you choose to fast or not, in the end, we adhere to 1 Corinthians 10.31. Whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, do all for the glory of God. Whatever practices we employ, we have the privilege of an ever-present God. 
We can outwardly do ordinary tasks throughout the day while inwardly we are engaging with prayer and adoration and song and worship. Every task of the day can be a sacred ministry to the Lord. Every mundane activity can become a sacrament. God is present in the ordinary. Sisters and brothers, God's peace to you as you discern and as you engage this Lenten journey that is before us. May you be drawn ever nearer to God and be continually transformed by God's presence. Amen. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. An angel went from God to a town called Nazareth to a woman whose name was Mary. The angel said to her, Rejoice, O highly favored, for God is with you. You shall bear a child, and his name shall be Jesus, the chosen one of God most high. And Mary said, I am the servant of my God. I live My soul proclaims your greatness, O God, and my spirit rejoices in you. You have looked with love on your servants here and blessed me all my life through. Great and mighty are you, O Holy One, strong is your kindness evermore. How you favor the
And whether that nourishes all of creation, God of mercy, hold us in love. Keep watch on our loved ones and keep us from danger. God of mercy, hold us in love. For all the beloved who rest in your mercy, God of mercy, hold us in love. Help us, comfort us all of our days. Keep us whole. Great and merciful God, source and ground of all goodness and life, give to your people the peace that passes all understanding and the will to live your gospel of mercy and justice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. God, remember us in your love and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless our God, Praise and thanks to you. May God, Creator, bless us and keep us. May Christ be ever light for our lives.